Okay, hello everyone and welcome back to the AutoML seminar. It's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Robert Lange. Robert is a fourth year PhD student at the Technical University of Berlin under the supervision of Henning Speckler. His research focuses on evolutionary meta learning. Um, during his PhD, he interned with DeepMind and Accenture. And yeah, apart from contributing great papers, Robert also maintains several open source libraries, among them as a checks based library for evolutionary strategies. Um, so thanks so much for joining today, Robert, and please take it from here. Thank you for having me, Aaron. Um, yeah, hello, welcome. Um, as uh, already introduced, I'm Robert, I'm a final year PhD student, and today I'm really excited to talk to you about um, two of my favorite topics, uh, one being um, evolutionary optimization and the other one being accelerated compute and JAX. And the title of my talk is Discovering Black Box Optimizers via Evolutionary Meta Learning. And uh, I have to say, this is a uh, joint work with a set of fantastic co-authors um, being uh, Tom Shao, Yu Tian Chen, um, Tom Sahavi, Valentin Dalibat, Chris Liu, who's also in the audience, Satrina Singh, and my host, um, Sebastian Flenahak. Okay, so let's get started with a um, more philosophical introduction to, to today's talk. So many of you probably know this famous painting by Michelangelo called uh, The Creation of Adam. And in this painting, you can see um, this magical moment in which God, an old white man, is about to instill life into Adam, the first human, a young white man. And basically, the beauty of this painting arguably arises from um, this latent silence and knowledge that something very special is about to happen when the two fingers of God and Adam are going to touch each other. And arguably, in machine learning research, we're currently at a similar inflection point where there are many people who have strong beliefs that scaling gradient descent based optimization and large transformer models is going to arise in AGI. And people oftentimes use the brain as inspiration for deep learning architectures and our own central nervous system and things like dopamine and the reward prediction error hypothesis as inspirations or motivations for, for pursuing this path. But what if it's actually just a local optima and we're not going to arrive at the special moment where the two fingers touch and we actually arrive at AGI? One biological process of which we know for sure that it has led to general intelligence in many different uh, ways is actually evolution and natural evolution as seen in biology. So maybe it's actually necessary to, to be a little bit more diverse and not only to do gradient data based uh, optimization all the time, but to essentially pick um, the best of both worlds, um, the best of uh, the insights that we've gained from gradient based optimization, as well as look a little bit outside and potentially even look at uh, computational evolution a little more. So that's what we're going to do today in, in, in this talk. But this is not supposed to be just an art history lesson. Um, I hope I can today tell you something more about our recent work on using uh, meta evolution to essentially discover new um, algorithms and um, in particular, uh, new black box optimizers. So this is now like a rough timeline or a sketch for how today's talk is going to look like. Um, I hope that I got you really excited by this uh, introduction. And um, afterwards, uh, in the next steps, we're going to, to review some, um, some background on black box optimization, and evolutionary optimization, before talking about um, my, my JEXPEX based library, um, EvoSax, which implements a set of evolutionary optimizers, and then go into the projects which I'm going to present today, uh, which essentially leverage these tools and these new advances in software as well as hardware accelerators. Um, to, to look at how these can be used for discovering new genetic algorithms and evolution strategies. And then finally, I'm going to uh, finish with uh, coming back to sort of a, a more philosophical perspective. Okay, so let's get started. Um, ah, before we get there, one more thing. Um, if you want to have a look at the slides or um, want to use them for something yourself at some point, um, there's like a tiny URL link called um, tinyurl.com slash learned evolution or learned evo, where you can find all the materials as well as code for, for certain reproductions of, of the work. Good. So I guess in some sense, I, I could probably skip um, this introduction to black box optimization in the AutoML seminar, but uh, nonetheless, for completeness, let me quickly go through it. 
So all of us probably know what white box um, optimization is, where we assume to have some form of objective function f and some form of um, input or a set of parameters x. And uh, we can evaluate that function, but we also at the same time assume that we have access to, to gradients or, um, or even Hessians. Right? And we can then use these um, together with great instant based optimization to, to um, train large language models. In black box optimization, on the other hand, we, we assume that we don't have access to, to these gradients or they might be um, ill behaved or simply hard to evaluate. And instead, what we can only do is evaluate the function and try to find um, good solutions by essentially doing something which is smarter than random search and uh, uses the evaluations in a more informed way. Okay, and there are many different black box optimizers out there. Um, they're also called zero order optimization methods such as random search, Bayesian optimization, successive halving, hyperband, which use some form of clever stopping criteria to distribute um, resources better. And there's also evolutionary optimization. And what I want to sort of argue today in, in the presentation is that evolutionary optimization kind of lies at a sweet spot where you can effectively um, also optimize small neural networks that perform or implement a type of algorithm um, and not only sort of optimize um, 10 to 20 hyperparameters that you're interested in. Okay. So um, now let's quickly talk about what an evolution strategy is. Um, evolution strategies are one type of evolutionary optimization algorithm, which uh, maintain a so-called search distribution, which is oftentimes a multivariate Gaussian with um, summary statistics M and um, some covariance matrix. Um, here it's, it's supposed to be, or assumed to be um, diagonal. And um, the search distribution is used to sample essentially different axes, which we evaluate in this black box manner as, as described before. And then after we, we evaluated the function, we essentially get fitness scores, which we can then use to update the search distribution, right? So intuitively, this updating of the search distribution moves our um, search distribution into the direction in which um, we're more likely to sample well-performing um, population members, right? And um, in practice, you then iterate sort of this procedure um, until you find a good solution or your AWS or GCP credits run out. Good. So this is sort of a little bit of background on evolutionary uh, or optimization and evolution strategies. Um, what are sort of the, the problems of uh, challenges for modern evolutionary optimization. So what I showed before was uh, like a simple um, sort of two-dimensional optimization problem where you can really quickly evaluate the function, but oftentimes we're interested in optimizing sort of uh, policies of, of robots or um, uh, optimizing hyperparameters of uh, our um, you know, network training pipeline, which can take quite some time. And uh, in practice, this means that you have to have some form of engineering infrastructure in place where um, you do these parallel rollouts or parallel evaluations um, uh, efficiently, right? And most of the times you don't only want to evaluate a set of parameters once, but you want to have a Monte Carlo estimate of the fitness, and you have to do it multiple times. And like in practice, people up to like fairly recently have mainly used sort of um, uh, task schedulers or um, Orcus creation tools like Dask and Ray to do this in parallel and across multiple devices. Nonetheless, um, you then need to set up sort of a controller and worker nodes and all these things. And there's some um, engineering overhead essentially associated with, with doing this. And this, uh, this problem, as well as sort of uh, the curse of dimensionality, which kind of applies to these random search optimization algorithms has led um, one of the godfathers of deep learning, Jan LeCun, to, to sort of argue that um, uh, black box optimization inherently is something that's very inefficient and um, is an evil that uh, sometimes you, you have to use, but um, if you can somehow avoid it, you, you, you want to do that. Okay. So this is where now JAX come to, comes into play, um, which allows us essentially to, to overcome many of these engineering obstacles as, way, as well as make um, evolutionary rollouts and evolutionary optimization more efficient in terms of war clock time. And JAX um, at its core um, might for many of you simply be um, just another automatic differentiation tool. Um, but to me, it's actually, um, 
a little bit more, or I guess we're, we're discovering uh, what that means, um, in the sense that it allows you to really efficiently vectorize and um, uh, parallelize evaluations of fitness scores. Okay, so JAX comes with um, so-called uh, primitives or function tra transformations, and like the most popular ones are um, JIT, uh, GRAD, DMAP, and PMAP, and GRAD simply allows you to compute the gradient of a, or the gradient evaluation of a function. JIT allows you to compile, or just a time compile um, a function or some operation. VMAP allows you to vectorize um, certain, or auto-vectorize certain function evaluations, and PMAP allows you to parallel evaluate um, these functions on different devices. So um, these different function uh, transformations can also be composed and allow us to do really, really powerful things. So what does that mean in the context of evolutionary optimization? Um, so basically, I, I already sort of spoke before um, about this inherent need to evaluate population members in parallel and to do so efficiently and fast in order to progress your search. And um, what this means is we sample different population members and we evaluate, for example, like robot policies in parallel for each one of these and for multiple Monte Carlo um, runs. And basically, if you write a simple function um, that's checks comfortable or compatible that evaluates sort of this, this um, sample, right? Then you can use VMAP and PMAP to distribute and auto vectorize this evaluation across or on a single accelerator like a GPU or a TPU, but as well across multiple ones, right? And this is all um, sort of then running um, on the accelerator without having to. Uh, introduce uh, sort of communication latency when when communicating the different fitness scores or, or um, yeah the different evaluations essentially. Another thing which we can do, which is um, something that excites me even more, is that we can essentially not only uh, vectorize and parallelize single or population rollouts, but we can also do so for entire um, algorithm runs. Right, so we can parallelize and um, vectorize um, full ES or black box optimization runs on the accelerator. So this means we don't have a single ES run, um, but we can have multiple in parallel. Right? So the simplest application of this would be to um, essentially go ahead and um, evaluate uh, your favorite black box optimizer on multiple random seeds or multiple different hyperparameters. But you can already imagine that you could also then try to do something like meta evolution um, by having just multiple evolution runs in parallel and then trying to optimize certain aspects of that evolution pipeline. Okay, and um, again, um, like this is not a JAX 101 kind of style tutorial, so I'm not gonna show you um, a lot of pseudocode, but literally these um, vectorization and parallelization operations are done by, um, yeah, sometimes a single line of code or two lines of code, right? And you can compose them. So you can uh, vectorize on a single machine and then parallelize across the three ones. Okay. So basically um, this is just sort of the intro into um, what I have been working on or what I'm going to show you next. But before we get there, um, let me quickly introduce this open source library um, that we already spoke to uh, spoke about during the introduction. So it's called um, EvoSax and uh, it essentially implements many of these um, evolutionary optimization algorithms that are listed on this slide natively in JAX. So that means that you can do these vectorization and parallelization operations. And this um, includes a set of finite difference gradient-based evolution strategies like OpenAIES or um, PGPE, um, as well as um, more traditional, I guess, or yeah, other evolutionary optimization um, uh, methods like estimation of distribution evolution strategies or genetic algorithms or different ES genetic algorithms, BBO style algorithms as baseline. Good. And they all come again in this, in this JAX compatible form. Now we're, we're going to kind of shift from, from the background se section to um, sort of how you can use all of these tools. And um, so sort of the projects that I've worked on all start from this um, kind of general observation that throughout the history of machine learning, we've moved from 
uh, manually designed algorithmic components to learned or discovered ones. So the simple example here um, in the top row shown is um, the move from SIFT features in computer vision to convolutional neural networks where you learn filters and um, don't have to sort of um, hard code or prescribe um, certain edge detection operations. Right? So this is probably what most of us are familiar with. Um, but recently, um, this has been extended um, to, to many more um, interesting, more algorithmic like operations, like for example, um, the work by uh, O et al, where um, they, they use uh, meta learning to discover essentially new reinforcement learning objective functions, right? Which are not necessarily um, as, as simple or white box as um, policy gradient methods, but they essentially capture certain inductive biases generated by the meta learning task distribution on which they were trained. Um, there, but there's a lot more work in the reinforcement learning um, uh, world, which was done by the discovery team in which I interned, for example, by, by Vivek Viraya on discovering options um, or, or others. The line of work that is most closely related to um, what I'm going to present to you um, is uh, the line of work by, by Luke Metz on essentially meta learning or meta discovering gradient based optimizers. Okay, so you probably saw or might have seen like the, the most recent paper on, on Velo, where they sort of show that it's possible to, to meta train um, gradient based optimizers, which are parameters to, to outperform sort of many tuned atom like baselines. Okay, so many of these have in common that they use this um, sort of paradigm or uh, toolbox of meta evolution, where uh, you define an algorithm, um, like for example, gradient descent, with some meta parameters, theta, and some inner loop parameters, which you try to optimize or um, yeah, change in the inner loop x, right? So in the inner loop, given a set of meta parameters, you would run your algorithm and you would change your x to x prime and do some form of evaluation um, in the end to, to get some form of performance. And then in the outer loop, you can use evolution to essentially update the meta parameters theta and based on the inner loop um, evaluation uh, performance, right? And um, this, this is a really sort of simple cookie cutter template. And there have been sort of many lines of work, including like I already spoke about, Luke Metz's work on gradient-based optimization or uh, work in computational neuroscience where people use this to discover um, new plasticity rules in uh, spiking neural networks, for example, or the work by, by Chris Liu on discovering better policy optimization algorithms or cheap talk channels um, for either helping or sort of uh, diminishing the performance of an agent. And finally, there's also uh, work on, on using this, for example, to discover synthetic uh, reinforcement learning environments as well, right? So basically here, um, all you have to change is sort of the inner loop um, medium, which you're trying to optimize and the inner loop rollout, then you can use JAX to vectorize or um, parallelize it. And then you use evolution, the outer loop to, to refine these parameters, right? And one sort of key trade-off in this setup that I wanna highlight is that um, basically um, you have to sort of choose um, how or uh, what you wanna optimize in the inner loop, right? So for example, the small multi-layer perceptron um, that is uh, parametrizing the gradient uh, descent based update in the inner loop. And then uh, based on how you parameterize what you want to um, optimize, like the theater, right? You can either have uh, easy or hard meta optimization dynamics, right? So intuitively, if you're just trying to optimize like the learning rate or in like discount parameter in RL, this might be easier than having to uh, meta optimize or meta discover an entire objective function. Okay, we're going to get back to that. So maybe you've already asked yourself, um, why can't we just use meta gradients instead of meta evolution? And um, traditionally, like many people have tried using meta gradients, especially in the reinforcement learning literature, and this has um, succeeded to a certain extent. Um, but oftentimes, like one limitation that you face is that um, it's very hard to compute these meta gradients through long unrolled computation graphs. So what do I mean by that? Let's imagine we have some form of um, algorithm, which takes as an input in X, you compute a loss L in, and then you perform some update to that X using your 
meta algorithm, let's say, uh, and it's denoted by rho theta. If rho is just the operation of the meta algorithm, and theta is the set of meta parameters of that algorithm. You can then sort of evaluate a meta objective in the end after doing this update and compute gradients through essentially this update step to change the meta parameters theta to theta prime. But in practice, we are oftentimes interested in actually doing this not only for a single step, but for multiple steps in sequence. And then you run into the same problems that you would face with um, sort of ungated uh, recurrent neural networks and sort of vanishing and exploding gradients that you see there where when like the sequence gets too long. So this is, for example, also shown um, in like a famous paper by Rasan Pashkanu, where he looked at um, sort of uh, what you can do in these cases and introduce sort of uh, gradient clipping and uh, binorm and so on. And he has this example where you have this very simple dynamical system, right? Um, this computation graph essentially, where um, you try to optimize a weight and a bias, and you have a nonlinearity and a nonlinear readout. And you essentially try to get the system to output at the final time step 0 0.5. And you can, in this case, just visualize how this loss landscape looks like um, for these two parameters. And you see that there's like this, um, this huge cliff, right? This huge instability, where essentially, if you're directly at the edge of the cliff, your gradient is going to be huge and you're going to jump away from where you actually want to end up, right? And this is just sort of the canonical example of an um, exploding gradient in a recurrent or in a dynamicism style optimization problem. If you now take evolution and um, you apply um, essentially um, yeah, a, small of, a small Gaussian filter to that landscape, uh, you get something that is way smoother and way uh, easier uh, or nicely behaved for performing optimization on these parameters. And this is essentially resulting from the nature of how evolution uh, samples from that search distribution, what I showed before. Okay, so at this point, you can already imagine how evolution might actually be a good thing to do in sort of these meta settings where you're interested in computing credit assignment signals over long horizon. Okay, so now we're going to um, sort of actually dive into the meat of sort of the results and the projects that uh, I've worked on. Um, and these include two papers. One on uh, using sort of these meta evolution style ideas to discover new evolution strategies. And um, this is published at iClear. So I'm actually traveling on Saturday to Rwanda. So if anyone's there and wants to talk about it, then hit me up at the poster session. And um, the other paper, which was recently accepted at this year's Gecko conference, which is about um, sort of taking the same um, perspective and using attention and self-attention to parameterize genetic algorithms and then meta-optimize and find the weights that sort of lead to good black box optimization. Okay, I think um, in terms of time, I'm, I'm doing good so far. Um, let me get started with part one. I assume we're going to have a question section at the end of the talk, right? Yeah, awesome. Good. Um, yeah, and uh, before I get started again, this was um, uh, joint work with a set of really, really cool co-authors who helped me and inspired a lot of these ideas. And uh, this was funded by, by my internship at UI. Good. So um, basically the starting point of the first project was um, a very simple evolution strategy, which takes as inputs fitness scores and applies some form of uh, rank-based or fitness-based transformation, which results in a set of weights W1 to Wn for N population members, and then uses these weights to perform updates to the mean and the standard deviation of our search distribution, right? So you remember like this was, um, uh, this goes back to like the introduction slide to evolution strategies, which have the search distribution and the mean and the standard deviation or covariance metric. And here, um, basically in this simple evolution strategy, um, the fitness scores are kind of ranked and the highest performing or best performing population member or evaluation gets the highest weight. So basically the mean is pulled the most into the direction of, of that well-performing population member. And um, similar in the variance is, is adjusted to increase essentially exploration in that direction. And here you have essentially these, these two learning rates, alpha M and alpha sigma. And um, in sort of, um, 
the, the standard simple evolution strategy setting, um, these functions like uh, this rank uh, transformation function is assumed to be static over time, right? So the population members change and uh, their fitness scores um, or evaluations are different from generation to generation. Um, but the functional shape with which you do the transformation is the same, as well as these learning rates are most of the times just um, assumed to be fixed all the time. So now sort of the main innovation or uh, insight that sort of uh, came into play for, for this paper was that we kind of realized that uh, these black box optimizers Ultimately, the update that you're performing is inherently a set operation, right? So you operate on a set of different population members and their performance or like their um, yeah, candidate solution location. Um, but the ordering of the population members within a population does not matter, right? It only matters essentially how well they perform and um, yeah, relative to the others. So um, a natural inductive bias to think about how you can potentially uh, parameterize the full new family of evolutionary optimizers is uh, in the form of self-attention and sort of a small set transformer. So what do I mean by sort of this inductive bias? And um, maybe let me do this a bit more explicitly with um, like an animation. Literally, like if the ordering of two population members switches, then the ordering of the weight that is assigned to that population member should switch in the same way, right? And thereby, since we do this uh, sum or weighted sum aggregation of um, the different locations and the difference from the mean, like the update is going to be the same, right? So this is basically um, uh, what allows us to, to use uh, small self-attention layers as a way or a medium to parameterize many different evolution strategies. Furthermore, what we also did is we, we used uh, different features or different transformations of the fitness instead of like the raw fitness in order to allow for, for better generalization across different fitness scales. So here, for example, we, we don't use the raw fitness, but we use um, center rank transformations, set score transformations, and a Boolean that indicates whether or not um, a population member has outperformed the previous best population. Another thing which we do is we hook up um, a small multilayer perceptron, which actually modulates the learning rate across generations. So this introduces now two sets of parameters, essentially the parameters of this um, set transformer, this small set transformer, and um, the parameters of this multilayer perceptron, which does the learning rate modulation. In the next uh, step, we, we kind of looked at how can we optimize these parameters using uh, meta-evolution. And um, basically what I'm showing you here in this animation is um, the way how uh, we, we do it. We essentially define a meta-optimizer. This in most experiments is um, simply CMAES. From CMAES, we sample a set of parameters and then we run different inner loop searches for the different parameters characterizing the learned evolution strategies on different problems and uh, construct uh, sort of meta fitness scores with which we update our meta optimizer to essentially improve the performance of uh, the learned evolution strategy. And yeah, this is um, sort of a, a good um, animation to maybe uh, dwell on for one second longer. Um, this is essentially, if you would replace um, sort of everything that's happening uh, from here on, I hope you can see my mouse. Um, the, the, you could plug in your favorite um, algorithm and parameterize it somehow using attention or some neural network and optimize um, it using evolution in the output. Good. So uh, let me quickly just say something about uh, what kind of tasks we optimize the parameters on. Um, like we chose um, for you know, computational reasons as well as um, due to some preliminary results showing that there's um, actually good generalization happening. Um, uh, we chose the set of black box uh, optimization functions um, from the BBOP benchmark, um, which sort of have different characteristics. Like for example, there are functions which are separable, so you can solve them um, quadrant wise, essentially. There are functions with moderate condition number. Uh, so this is like the ratio between the eigenvalues of the Hessian and functions with uh, high condition number, multimodal uh, functions uh, with weak and uh, strong local global structure and um, added noise to the function evaluations, right? So 
This is basically just sort of the set of tasks on which we optimize the weights of our LES um, ultimately uh, and run the inner loops on. Good. Um, and what I'm showing you here is essentially um, just animations of uh, the learned evolution strategy. And uh, you can see sort of in, in red, the dots are in different samples. And um, the, the star here is the, the, the global optimum. And you can see that the learned evolution strategy has learned to do optimization on these low dimensional um, functions, while um, like a randomly initialized neural network or is self-attention layer would not necessarily encode that inductive bias, right? So this is something that popped out of uh, meta-optimization, right? Um, furthermore, we can see here that um, in blue, in this blue box, we show sort of what kind of functions with dimensions and population size were meta-trained on, and the other um, uh, grid cells are in settings where essentially the system generalizes to, to larger population sizes and more numbers of dimension. And you can see as the number of dimensions grows with a fixed budget, the performance gets worse, right? Because the problem gets harder. But as you increase the number of uh, population members, it essentially can recover good performance just by having a higher or bigger budget of evaluations. Furthermore, here on the right, you can see that on, on different of these low um, dimensional functions, which are um, trained and test functions. And uh, basically LES outperforms uh, separable CMAES, which is a different diagonal ES baseline and is um, fairly competitive with uh, SNES, which is a uh, natural evolution strategy, which uses um, yeah, essentially some form of uh, inverse Fisher information in order to precondition uh, yeah, gradient updates or uh, fitness gradient updates. Good. So here already we, we kind of see that there's um, some strong generalization happening um, of the learned evolution strategy on these low dimensional VBOP functions and uh, with higher uh, number of dimensions and smaller or larger population sizes. Next, we wanted to look at whether or not this also already works on neuroevolution tasks. And after um, a little bit of uh, tweaking, we essentially um, found uh, that it did. So basically here, we're showing a set of um, BRACs, continuous control tasks, eight of them. In red, we're showing our learned evolution strategy. And in the other colors, we're uh, showing different baselines. And we can essentially see that um, the learned evolution strategy performs uh, well across the board and on many of the tasks um, outperforms all of the baselines. Um, uh, this is sort of just an aggregated picture where we normalize by the performance of uh, OpenAIES and again see that ag aggregated across these eight tasks, uh, learned evolution strategies perform uh, really well. Uh, next, uh, we, we also looked at um, generalization across population sizes and wanted to assess whether or not the performance of LES can uh, you know, uh, scale with larger populations. And basically on the x-axis here, you see the population size and on the y-axis some normalized performance score. And again, like um, LES seems to scale really well with uh, higher population sizes and can make use of this increased uh, budget. And here in this gray line, importantly, this is sort of a meta training um, setting, uh, which was seen during meta training. And uh, uh, it seems like it's still, or it is enough to lead to strong generalization, even across longer horizons, larger populations. Good. Um, another thing which we looked at is uh, how does the meta task distribution essentially um, influence how well um, the learned evolution strategy performs. And uh, we can see that as we increase the number of uh, BBOP functions, which we use during meta training in the inner loop, essentially the performance gets better. Right? So um, this just means we cover different types of problems and um, the learned evolution strategy cannot simply overfit uh, just performing well on uh, quadratics, for example, but it also has to, to be able to work on multimodal objective, um, uh, fitness objectives. Good. Um, now, sort of uh, a key question is, uh, we have this uh, learned or meta learned set transformer. Uh, what is it actually doing? Uh, what are sort of the computations that it has learned or the adaptive computations that it has learned? On the left-hand side here, uh, we're showing um, sort of on a Walker 2D task, like only in the top um, 30 
uh, sort of weights assigned by, by rank. And you can here already see that the learned evolution strategy can perform either a type of hill climbing where like a very high weight is assigned to the best population member, or it can integrate many different well-performing population members. Here on, on the right, um, we show uh, an ablation study where we sort of ablate uh, away the learning rate uh, modulation, as well as the uh, sort of weight uh, output of the set transformer and fix that to be sort of uh, one of these fixed functions that I showed before. And you can see that essentially both of them um, matter and positively contribute to the overall performance of um, the ELIA. Uh, finally, um, we, we also looked at whether or not we can um, take the neural network based evolution strategy that we meta learned and uh, compress it or reverse engineer it into an analytical form. Right? Um, so Chris Liu did uh, really awesome work in um, sort of computing types of or visualizing types of impulse response functions where you give um, fitness scores to the learned evolution strategy and look at what the weights are, are that are being outputted. And uh, in this plot here in the left corner, um, you can essentially see that it's possible to fit um, a type of well, inverted um, thick moid to this impulse response function and to then afterwards use that as a new discovered evolution strategy, which is no longer a neural network, but um, just a analytical equation with a temperature parameter. And um, here on the right, we're essentially showing that um, when you do that and you tune this temperature parameter well, you essentially get something that performs on par with the learned evolution strategy. So here, um, the takeaway is not that, hey, um, we don't need a transformer or we don't need to do all of that. Here, the takeaway is much more um, that we can use meta-evolution as well as flexible parameterization of our inner loop to essentially discover new algorithms which are still interpretable. Okay, cool. Um, so just a quick um, interlude, you can use um, EvoSax and import uh, LES and the reproduced uh, checkpoint. And um, the API is as simple as sort of the walkthrough that I showed before. You initialize an evolution strategy. You ask for um, a new set of axes to evaluate and then run that evaluation using, for example, Jack's parallelism and then update the search distribution using the strategy.tel call. So this is sort of the standard I guess, black box optimization um, style API that you know from many libraries out there. Okay, so um, one reason why I got excited by, by all of this was um, that I read Jürgen Schmidt Huber's diploma thesis in which he sort of argues for um, sort of self-referentially refining uh, genetic algorithms and uh, sort of this vision of just stacking them on top of each other and each one of them improving the performance of the downstream one. Right? And um, unlike uh, one sunny weekend, or no, I say one rainy weekend, um, I basically tried if one could do something similar um, in, in this learned evolution setup, where instead of using CMAES as the outer loop optimizer, you essentially use um, itself randomly initialized and then try to essentially perform outer loop updates using uh, or starting from, from random search. So what do I mean by that? Instead of CMAES, we now use LES in the outer loop, but it starts off being randomly initialized. And then only after making progress or randomly making progress in the inner loop, we perform um, hill climbing updates, which replace the meta parameters if there was an improvement in the inner loop. Right. So here, like the middle column, this is what we had before, just using the set transformer to compute um, the weights with which we combine the different population members. And uh, now the only change is that the outer loop optimizer is also LES, which um, has the self-referential hill climbing update step uh, where we replace the meta parameters if there was an improvement in the inner loop. And uh, it turns out, lo and behold, uh, you, you can do this and you can also get something um, out of this procedure that performs um, black box optimization, but we're not yet there where it performs better than just using uh, CMAS in the outer loop optimizer. This um, has a couple of reasons which I can talk about um, afterwards. 
um, mainly related to instability and um, yeah, being a diagonal um, evolution strategy and not like a, a full covariance one potentially. Good. Uh, let me now come to the second point, which was about uh, using the same sort of intuition um, to discover genetic algorithms. And uh, I'm going to be a bit more brief um, about this. This is um, the recent Gecko paper. Um, uh, the intuition or the, the setup um, and what we do is uh, very similar to what we did before. Um, but now instead of using self-attention to parametrize an evolution strategy, we use self and cross-attention to parametrize genetic algorithms and then run the same meta-evolution. So um, let's just quickly talk about uh, what a genetic algorithm is. Um, at its core, um, at least from my perspective, a, a genetic algorithm differs from an evolution strategy in uh, the way that it does not maintain a single search distribution, but instead it maintains a um, um, an archive of well-performing parents. Okay, so this is just sort of an uh, uh, you could think of it as a matrix where you have numbers of uh, parents times the numbers of dimensions of your search vector, and um, then based off of these parents, you sample children with replacement and apply some form of mutation. And this gives you then a new point segregate, these red points, and then based on whether or not these red points improved uh, upon their parents or upon sort of the, um, the worst performing members in the archive, um, you essentially perform a, a update that replaces the parents or the worst performing parents in the archive. Okay. And then again, you can iterate this, this process. But the core um, difference is you don't have a single search um, distribution, but you have an archive and you perform mutation and selection. And um, as I already said, um, in the second follow-up Gecko paper, what we did is we used the same, exact same sort of outer loop setup. So running uh, inner loop uh, black box optimization runs using the slow genetic algorithm on, um, uh, on bebop functions. Um, and then in the outer loop sort of updating the, the meta parameters based on the performance in the inner loop. But now instead of using the LES uh, setup, we use um, now cross attention to essentially parametrize uh, selection. And we use self attention to parametrize a uh, form of mutation rate adaptation where the mutation rates of the individual children are moved or are changed on the fly. And um, yeah, there, there, there are details on sort of the uh, way how we construct features, which I'm gonna uh, gloss over here. I, I can answer them if people are interested. Um, but essentially, this is the way how we, again, make use of attention to parametrize set operations in the context of genetic. Good. So here, um, this is just one slide to um, persuade you or to uh, say, hey, this, this works, and it works um, better than baselines on, on many tasks. And um, it can even, on some tasks, compete um, fairly clearly with um, evolution strategies, which are usually uh, assumed to be better for, for neuroevolution tasks. Okay, so here on the left, we show sort of the performance um, on HPOB, like this black box optimization benchmark, uh, the continuous version using uh, surrogate models, and um, uh, it performs uh, given sufficient um, budget, uh, it can sort of reach performance levels of, uh, of Optiformer, and um, yeah, it performs several genetic target baselines. Good. Um, we can again uh, look at um, what the selection and uh, sort of the mutation rate uh, adaptation is doing. And what we find is that um, essentially it, uh, the uh, selection operation uh, duplicates uh, parents in the archive, right? So in traditional genetic algorithms, each parent is sort of only represented once in the archive. But here, like the learned operator has learned to keep duplicates of the different parents, which in turn change the uh, sampling distribution from which you sample children, right? So it can adaptively essentially uh, change and um, uh, on the fly, the uh, amount of elitism that's being applied when, when performing selection. So the more like this is now on a, on a sphere task, so like just a convex quadratic, we can see that uh, correctly over time, the uh, mutation rate is being lowered to essentially zoom into the optimum at the origin. 
yeah, and essentially there's still some heterogeneity across the mutation rates um, across sort of subpopulations, which is also um, interesting. Uh, finally, and this is the last thing I'm, I'm going to say about uh, the learned genetic algorithms, you can also take the individual learned neural network components, like the learned selection and the learned mutation rate adaptation, and plug them into white box uh, genetic algorithms. Right? So uh, here in red, you can see um, the LGA in its fullest form, and in, in gray, you can see like a simple Gaussian genetic algorithm. And then if you add to it the learned selection, um, it gets the boost essentially of that learned op operator and we see positive transfer of these meta-learned neural network components. Good, so let me quickly summarize um, what I've showed you today. Um, I showed you two ways how to parameterize black box optimization algorithms, one in the form of evolution strategies and one in the form of genetic algorithms. And I showed you that if you meta-train them on uh, a, a fairly small set of black box optimization uh, functions in the form of these bebop functions. Uh, we can achieve strong generalization even to neural evolution tasks. And to HBOB, for example, I showed you how you can then take this neural network discovered uh, genetic uh, or black box optimization algorithm and try to reverse engineer it into something that's interpretable and for which you might be able to uh, obtain theoretical guarantees. And I showed you um, something that excited me the most, which was um, sort of the self-referential training setup. Let me now um, quickly talk about uh, one thing um, that sort of sh or shaped uh, my way or how I think about um, like the future of machine learning or how to go forward uh, with machine learning research. And this is um, basically this uh, metaphor or analogy of uh, survivorship bias, and a recent paper by uh, Sarah Hooker on the hardware lottery. So maybe, yeah, you know or have read uh, Nicolas Nazim Taleb, Black Swan, and, and these kinds of things, um, where uh, oftentimes uh, there, there is a chapter on uh, survivorship bias and um, uh, this airplane story from the Second World War, where an airplane returned successfully after the war back home and had all these bullet, hole, bullet holes in, in red. And after um, the plane returned, uh, the engineer sort of started talking about uh, what to reinforce from that airplane, right? So intuitively, maybe you might think um, at first glance, hey, let's reinforce um, the holes, right? Because these are the weak points and um, uh, maybe we can make the plane even more robust by reinforcing the holes. But um, in practice, what this observation or this data point uh, of that airplane basically means is that all these other parts, they can have holes and the airplane still successfully returns home, right? So what that means is you don't reinforce what's weak, but you should reinforce what's working, right? Or what's actually at the core of um, making things happen. And to me, um, oftentimes in, in, in machine learning, it can feel like where we're coming up with all these hacks for making things work, which may not be meant to work in the first place, right? So we come up with things like uh, gating uh, in recurrent neural networks because we have vanishing and exploding gradients. We come up with super specialized hyperparameters from graduate student descent, like this super famous Kapathy constant. We come up with things like skip connections, um, uh, pre and post layer norm, layer normalization, and so on. And to me, um, these things are all trying to combat certain weaknesses of gradient descent while not necessarily honing into the strengths of it. Right? And potentially evolution can allow us to discover new things which allow us to zoom into the strengths even more and um, to, to essentially give us something beyond uh, what the current paradigm is giving us. Good, and then the last thing uh, on the hardware lottery, um, maybe some of you probably know this paper because it was pretty influential. Um, the hardware lottery essentially just uh, summarizes this insight that every scientific um, advance is sort of guided by the hardware and the lottery uh, and the, the software stack that sort of supports it. Right? So when we think of the ImageNet moment, um, it wouldn't have been possible without uh, um, Alex Krzyzewski coding CUDA kernels and making it possible to essentially train large confidence on GPUs, right? And he wouldn't have been able to do it without 
CUDA and sort of this way of programming the GPU. Um, so many of the advances that came afterwards in the form of PyTorch, TensorFlow, JAX, like they, they make our life easier, but they also just um, kind of guide us into one direction of research while there's a lot more to exploit in, in different directions. And I hope that I could somewhat convince you um, today that um, JAX and sort of vectorization, parallelization, and meta-evolution may open up uh, many new research directions going forward. Yeah, um, I think uh, just one more pointer to Evo Sachs, and um, I think with this slide I'm going to end and open up for questions. Thank you very much for your attention.